sunrise morning Such a pretty sight Pink clouds drifting Pushing back the night Sunrise morning I predicted rain Never sun would shine again last night last night i couldn't sleep away all i could do was think and wish we'd never said goodbye at all you could The grass grows greener for you Down a nameless avenue Well, everybody knows That grass never grows In the smoky city air Neat the sun that doesn't care Come home Ah, oh, you know you better come home now Take two. Hey, there we go. Sounds like the microphone's operational. All right, everybody. Welcome to Roleplaying Unlimited presents Agent Orange. Across the Pecos world-building stream here. I'm going to build this pretty much on the live stream here. I've just got the bare bones assembled here. Chat, webcam frames, title screen at the top 
Agent Orange campaign name at the bottom. And yeah, this will serve as partly instructional for how to build your own stream. But also, just a little fun project for constructing all of this live. So first and foremost, I want to get my Roll20 account loaded up. There we go. A few different campaigns. Agent Orange. T minus nine days before this thing kicks off. Okay. And firstly, I want to adjust that. Just like so. Some of these things we do not need to really see on the live stream. Guess Just give it a little more professional look. Plus, it also allows us to expand the size of the map, which, as we can see right now, is literally just the bare bones, just a plain white grid. Okay, so we have one of those. Actually, gonna need to add a second display capture for the chat log. Maybe then. Perfect. It's going to do the exact same thing. We're going to transform that using the right clicker, pan down to fit to screen, and then exact same thing. Alt key, and just grab each corner, or each side I should say. And in this case I'm shrinking it down to just the chat log. And right about there. Actually, no, I want it higher than that. We don't need to see what's being typed, merely what is being posted. I've done this enough times just to know that we really only need a tiny bit here. That's what's going to be presented right there. Yep, yep. Yeah, that should work. I'll do a couple tests. Right here on the side, roll some D20s, and nothing happens, which is exactly what you don't want to be happening. Hmm. There we go. Looks like there's just a slight delay. Not sure why. Get that display capture down towards the bottom of the sources list. That's going to be on the far back side of everything, so it doesn't need to be anything up near the front. Alert box, you definitely want on the front side. Okay, so next up, the arbitrary assignment of the player's webcam positioning. So we have J-Man right down there on the bottom right. I'm using the Goth Pathway font. And this one will be for Evil Dawn. Using the white font color for the characters, I'm using orange for everything else, just as a slight differentiation. Okay, and Don we will place right there on the left side of the screen. Speaking of which, Lord Grelix throwing a prime subscription here during our setup phase. Thank you kindly for that, brother. So that is... Hey, and there's Grelix right there in the chat log. What's going on, man? Okay, so Evil Dawn, we have his source. Let's go ahead and get Mr. James. He will be next. And we're going to play around with this one just a little bit. 
stick with the white. Gothic font, perfect. And James will be the buff one. We'll throw him up there on the top right. I don't know, it looks a little bit, a little bit like buffle. That's not what we're going for. There we go. We'll just spell it out. A little less playful, but a little bit more precise and clear. Otherwise, it's like uh, that movie, That Thing You Do, where they're the band called The Wonders, but it looks like The O'Neaters. Yeah, we'll try to avoid that if we can. Okay, and then up next, we're gonna go with Raven. If I can type correctly. I wish it carried the text preferences forward, but I guess that would be more of a, a copy-paste kind of thing. I don't know how precise that is. I prefer to add everything individually as its own separate source. And if I can grab that. Raven is playing hard to get. There we go. All right. He is in place. We'll go ahead and add Mr. John up next. Let's see. Goth again. And John. I think in his case... We will just go with the tried and true MURTA in all caps. Give everybody a little bit of a fun deviation on their name here for this what will be a probably short campaign. We're only going to do this for the month of October, so that gives us four Tuesdays. Let's see. Oh, thank you, Don. Thank you, Gail. How's that? I turned down the music a little bit more there, but I can easily crank it down. It's on multiple sources. I got it playing through my personal library, but also the volume settings through Streamlabs. Looks like I'm coming out twice as loud as it as the music now. How about that? Okay, and last but not least, yours truly. I will be Mr. Orange. Let's go ahead, goth that up a little bit more. Mr. Orange. And because I am the orange one, what I will do is my font color will be orange. Perfect. Hey, Jalen, how you doing? Good to see you. Uh-oh, what happened, Grillix? Giants get a touchdown? Or are you applauding my naming myself Mr. Orange? <laughs> All right, so there's the, the framework coming together a little bit more. Now what I need to do is get the Discord set up correctly. So that's going to be a window capture. Oh, I'm doing all right. Just a little bit creativity here, building this up. This will be our zombie apocalypse game here, starting the first Tuesday of, uh, of October. Carlsbad, New Mexico. One of our players lives down there in New Mexico as well, down in Roswell, so hopefully he jumps in on the stream here sometime soon, because I'm hoping to get his character constructed during this setup stream. Giants lost to the Falcons by a field goal. Yikes! Okay. 
where... Hmm. Doesn't seem like it's registering my Discord. So let's try that. Yep. There. Okay. I am in the role-playing Unlimited Assemble channel. But for whatever reason, it's not picking it up. This can be tricky sometimes. It happens a lot with Streamlabs and Discord. Sometimes there's just a communications issue. So what I'll do is I'll dis I will erase the Discord source and then I'm just going to add it right back in now that Discord is open in the primary window and hopefully that will do it. There it is. Yep, sure enough. So Agent Orange Discord, now I can add that as a source. And what I want to do here, fit that to screen, Alt key, kill everything that is not essential. And then of course, since I'm doing this in the role-playing unlimited assemble channel, Lord Grelix, anytime during this stream, if one of you jump in, I can kind of start setting up the the videos in that respect. Matter of fact, bing! Hello, that's me. All right, so now we have video source set up. And the band you hear playing right now, that's these guys right here. That's my dad's band from 1972, 73, named Sod. That's also them right there a little rare promo picture of them from back in the day all right so mr orange i'm gonna fit right up in there and matter of fact i think what i will do cut down some of my background here grelix in the car all right Running an errand, or were you listening to the game on the radio? Old school. Just stretch those out a little bit more. Eh. Perfect. That should work. Bum, 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 bum. Hey, Valthers, what's going on, brother? Alright, so there's me. I'm on the screen. There is our roll 20 setup. And we have five empty frames. So once the buff one, Murtaugh, J-Man, Evil Dawn, and Raven are on the screen, I can set up their video sources accordingly, doing the exact same thing. Oh shoot, man, not too much, Valtheris, just building a campaign from absolute nothing. You can see here, we have only the five characters constructed. Watch the game at a bar. Oh, okay, very nice. And I have zero maps built for this campaign either, so this is going to be a mad dash over the next nine days to get this campaign up and going. It is very fulfilling, Valtheris. I enjoy it very much. I've been doing it pretty much week in and week out for 30 years now, I would say. All right, so my marketplace purchases are quite extensive here, as we can see. I think I will start with my Apocalypse Metropolis set. Yeah, here we go. This is the one, or these are the ones that I constructed or that I purchased specifically for zombie apocalypse campaigns. So I have a hotel and casino, a big city ballpark, tokens for humans and zombies, suburbs, city, and inner waste highway now our last campaign took place a very 
great deal inside the hotel and casino. So I think this time I want to use the ballpark. I did not use that really at all in our last campaign. And instantly I realize part of the confusion with these sets. A lot of the sets that you purchase through Roll20, they're going to have the dimensions listed after it. So it'll say like junk sign 4x4. Four four, so I know how many squares to make it when I'm putting it on the map. But this set, they're just giving me northeast, northwest, southeast, southwest. I have no idea how big these are supposed to be. And I guess that can work in your favor because it can be kind of subjective. But at the same time, I like to know what the artist's intentions were when constructing these sets. So we're just going to enlarge in this set up here. There we go. Take me out to the ball game. Okay. I at least want it to be 25 by 25. That's your default roll 20 map size. And then you can adjust your grids accordingly to whatever you want. Uh-oh. There we go. Well, something's not right. Okay. That looks alright. What I want to do though now, I'm going to make the map page. I'm going to double it up. 50 by 50. That is true, Valtheris. Role playing takes up a ridiculous amount of time sometimes. It's not even funny just how much time you can spend putting these things together. And from the Game Master's side of things, how much time you can spend putting it together versus how long you actually spend playing it can get depressing at times. <laughs> okay, I'm going to set these dimensions a little more manually here. 25 by 25 per. Let's get these all to size. 25... 25 Oops Trying to do a little little quicker here Excellent Nope, that's not lined up There it is And the southwest Set dimensions. One thing I'm glad about with Roll20, as many improvements as they've made to their setup over the years, it has at least remained consistent from a control standpoint. So a lot of the shortcuts and the buttons are where they've always been, so there's not a lot of relearning the system. All right. And you know what occurs to me just now? I think... I had this map built already in a previous Agent Orange. So let me go here to our transmogrifier. And I want to find... Yeah, these are all the campaigns I've run over the last few years here in Roll20. Many more before that in person. But through Roll20, Agent Orange 77. I feel like that's the one we want. Yeah, here we go. Characters. Mm, handouts. Jukebox. Can't use any of that. So it looks like just the maps. I'm going to grab Baseball Stadium. Desal Outpost. Stadium interior. That might be all I need. Let's see what we're looking at. Okay, so my old baseball stadium looks pretty identical 
to the last one. The only difference here is I've actually populated this map with the occasional survivor, including this guy from, man, I think, I think I saw this guy in The Godfather, or was it The Godfather 2? I'm not sure. And we have, oh, survivor with the katana, pretty cool. This may be what I end up using. Yeah, I like the look of this. I thought I had something special about this area. Maybe it was just in my head. I didn't actually build anything onto the map. Yeah, some of these tokens are pretty raunchy, but very fitting for a post-apocalyptic setting. All right, so we got a couple options as far as baseball stadium is concerned. That's right, here's the inside of the stadium, and it's only one, one level of the stadium, I believe, and I had some more tokens scattered around here. I honestly don't even remember what the intent was for this map. This was an unused part of our Agent Orange 77 campaign. That campaign, unfortunately, kind of got scrapped at the last minute. One week we were playing, one week the whole thing was over, and some of these maps have just been sitting around for three years or so. But I like to keep them just in case they can be repurposed. Haha! <laughs> General with the rocket launcher! Uh, he looks familiar. Okay. Dassault Outpost. Oh, yeah. Another unused. You can see here, most of the map is shaded, which means from the player's perspective, they would not be able to see this initially upon coming into town. And this was all built piecemeal, if I recall correctly. I literally put each piece of these streets down, connected them, put each of the lots down. And the Dasal outpost was one of the few places in our last Agent Orange campaign where civilization was starting to rebuild. But again, as we can see by the unused nature of this map, this was another section of the campaign that we didn't really get far into. We visited the outpost on a couple occasions and got some pretty cool upgrades and equipment and what have you, but that was about it. I'll have to check over my notes from that old campaign just to see if any of this can be repurposed. I'm sure the maps I can find use for, but the plots sometimes can be reused. Sometimes they just kind of get tossed to the wayside. So that gives us a few maps. Streaming setup is set up okay. I'm not sure why there's such a weird... Yeah. It's cutting it off a lot more than I had expected it to. Ah, that might be too small. I don't know. I can make it taller so it would be able to see more information in the chat log. Did the other one ever show up? Alt. There it is. So my D20 and my D10 rolls. I'm sure that's okay. For the most part, the information in the chat log is kind of an afterthought feature. It's, it's handy to have the roles and some of the in-game dialogue that we text there for our own edification and also for the viewers to be able to see everything that's taking place. But it's something that I'm considering more and more with each campaign actually taking out of the stream side of things because it's a small box, but that's still a, it's valuable real estate on the streaming side of things.
So what's everybody's day looking like? Looks like we got a few viewers in here right now. Thank you for coming to check this out. Hope you're having a great Sunday. It is Sunday? Yeah, it is. Now here is Jason's character's background. Jason is consistently one of our first players to have his character ready, to have backstories created. And I feel like he did this yesterday, because I posted in our chat log, hey, the roll 20 page is open for Agent Orange, character sheets are open, feel free to jump in and start creating your characters. We're running out of time, so get on it. Here's what Jason came up with in just a few hours. We have a Halloween baby here, born 1031-1948, blonde hair, blue eyes. Tech Sergeant, U.S. Air Force, 597th SMS Walker Air Force Base, Roswell, New Mexico. Hailing from Colorado Springs, Colorado, Eric Wolf had a typical childhood. His father a plumber, his uncle an electrician. Both apprenticed him through his junior high and high school summers. He worked a part-time job over his senior year of high school. He graduated at a small garage and learned basic engine maintenance. This, coupled with his love of electronics, he would install speakers and radios as well as most electrical work on vehicles. He did basic engine work as well, like tune-ups, oil changes, basic maintenance. All this changed when he was drafted into the Vietnam War in 1965. It's this whole other country. It was expected, and he went when he was called. He served a single tour in the U.S. Army in the 1st Cavalry Division as a door gunner aboard a UH-1, a Huey. Very cool. He volunteered for this position when he arrived at his unit in Vietnam. He trained to be a maintenance crew aboard the Huey, and served with his tech sergeant maintaining and manning the door guns. Eric was offered a choice at the end of his tour. Because he scored high on his AFQT, he was offered a chance to enlist in his choice of branch or serve one more tour in the Army before he would be discharged. Eric chose to enlist in the Air Force and trained to work in a missile silo over the next year. He arrived in Roswell, New Mexico, he requested some place dry after all the rain in Vietnam in 1969 to start his new job. Over the last year, he gained rank quickly as he excelled in his job. Rotations of others to be trained came to his silo to learn silo maintenance. He purchased a new 1968 Chevelle Double S in Sequoia Green in celebration of surviving his tour in Vietnam. That's definitely cause for celebration. And his promotions in the Air Force. He lived in a small home in Roswell with a few other of his crewmates, an officer on his silo crew as well as other enlisted men from another crew. Well, Jason, you never fail to disappoint. I'm sorry, you never fail to impress. You never disappoint <laughs> with your character setups. These are cool character sheets. I like that they've been added in like they have here. And looks like something is messed up on his sheet here too. Let me double, let me load that again. Hmm. Not sure why that would be the case. Yeah, it's already different just from earlier when I was accessing. These buttons here at the top should have text that indicate what the sections of the character sheet are you going to. I like the character sheet, I just don't, I think the red clashes a little bit too much with the white background. I mean, I can barely read character history right here. And unfortunately, Roll20 doesn't have a dark mode yet. Alright, so there's Jason's character. He does not have anything done. Aside from the backstory, which of course is arguably the hardest thing to do. The skills and mechanical parts of the character sheet. 
comes together pretty quick. This is a pretty easy system. Not a lot to it. So I think what I'm going to do next is actually begin constructing John's character. He has requested to play a medic kind of character, but he doesn't really have much interest in crafting the character himself. He kind of likes the concept of the GM creating the character for him, and then he, he likes to roll with it. I kind of enjoy doing it that's, that way as well. So what I'm going to do is step off camera here for just a minute to grab my All Flesh Must Be Eaten source books. That's the name of the system we're playing here for Agent Orange. And also my glasses. I'm having a little hard time focusing here, especially with this weird character sheet. So I shall be right back and we'll get rolling on this character. All right, I am back. Just a second here. So what you got going with your uh, your day off there, Val? You watching football like Evil Dawn or what's up? Oh, very cool. Yeah, I know a few people that play that one. I haven't even seen it yet. I don't see any of my streamer friends that play it either, which would probably be my lo my most likely way of actually seeing it. Alrighty. So John's character here. All flesh must be eaten. It's a pretty cool game. It's by the uh, Unis system, I believe it's called. And they actually do other systems too, like Buffy the Vampire Slayer and a number of other settings that kind of all merge together. This one, uh, One of the Living, is the source book for the survivors. And these are the only two books that I have for All Flesh. And these characters are going to be norms. There's three different types of characters you may be the norm, the survivor, or the inspired. The inspired is definitely your highest tier and brings in a sort of magic, almost, into a zombie apocalypse setting, which can be fun, but that's not what Agent Orange is. It's more classic zombie horror where the characters are very ill-prepared. We've done a few zombie or a few Agent Orange campaigns where the characters were playing survivors, so they were a bit better equipped to withstand the assaults coming at them. But in this case, what we're going to be doing is going back to the classic roots of the norm. Is it a free game there, Don, or is it one that has a cost? Because I have a bad, bad habit of buying games and playing them once and then putting them down as the next game comes up, and I'm really trying to break myself out of that, especially with how much time I spend just creating these games. I need to, when I'm playing a game, I need to find something that I can stick with for a while. I'm not doing myself any favors. <laughs> okay, so norms are getting 14 points for attributes. So in John's case, these are the primary attributes. 
The practical human limit is a five. Attributes range between one and five, one being below average, two is average, three is slightly above, and five are like your superhumans. Technically, a human can go up to a six in an attribute. It's just very, very costly to do so, and definitely not recommended if you're playing a norm, because you're going to spend eight of your 14 points to raise one attribute to max, and then you'll have six points left for the other five. Okay, so in John's case, I'm thinking we want intelligence as his highest attribute, so a four. Free on Game Pass. I don't have Game Pass. <laughs> Damn it. I think John's going to need to be a bit perceptive. When buying your points one through five, it's point for point. So I could buy up to a five for a five point. Now, we've already spent seven of John's 14, so now he has seven points left for his other four attributes. So, I mean, we could do three twos and a one, which I think is what we're going to do. He's going to be two willpower, two con, two dex, one strength. So, he's going to be pretty, pretty weak. Three, five, nine, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Perfect. That adds up. All right. I know uh, Big Daddy Pancake also plays some arc, if I'm not mistaken. 14 for attributes. Now we have our secondary attributes, which are here. Life points, endurance, speed, essence pool, we're not really going to mess with. You only really need that if your characters are have access to metaphysical type abilities. You have something, you named the tower. What'd you name the tower? <laughs> All right. So for life points, we want to add the con and the strength together, which would be a mighty three. Multiply it by four, so we got a 12, and add 10, so 22. 22 life points for John's character. Formula is best written as con plus strength times 4 plus 10. Yep, human range is 18 to 58. So John is just slightly above the lowest average of life point average. Endurance points, it's going to be a similar formula. We're going to add con, strength, and willpower. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5... Multiply by 3, so 15, and add 5. So he'll have 20. 20 con points. Endurance points, I should say. So I want to make sure. Con, strength, and will. Multiply by 3, plus 5. Human range, 14 to 59. Yep. Jason is going mechanical route. Maybe go the charismatic psychic. <laughs> Less the psychic, absolutely. Part of the problem, I won't even. I wouldn't say it's a problem so much either, but it's a trickier road maybe with charismatic characters in this system because charisma is not an attribute. It's actually a quality. It's like a. It's like a perk or a drawback. So you have to kind of purchase those separately. And you can purchase them in different tiers as well. Okay, so speed, the final secondary attribute here for John's character. Con plus dex, that's a four, times two is eight. So John can run eight miles an hour. Half that number is the number of yards that the character runs in a second. So John's speed is about four yards a second. I'm not, I haven't locked down the combat system on this yet, so I don't know how movement plays into that, but it is definitely something that we're gonna need to lock down here sooner than later. Okay, qualities and drawbacks. Now this will be a little trickier. Norms get five points. Right? Five points for qualities and up to ten points in drawbacks. 
Norms may not purchase the gift or inspiration qualities. Gotcha. So, Dawn is playing the original owner of the Psychic Eye. All right. Now that is something here you got to learn. Is what you take you got to give in return. Ba -da -ba. There we go. Qualities and drawbacks. This can be pretty heavy, and this is definitely something that will be adjustable depending on what I talk to John about. I don't want to make his character a somebody who has an addiction to heavy use of heroin, if that's not something he doesn't want to play. Likewise, I don't want to give him an artistic talent if he had no desire of playing a character with that kind of skill. Charisma, there's a... It's a variable quality or a drawback. If you have a negative charisma, you can get points in return for that just by being awkward and always saying the right thing and pissing everybody off that you talk to. Charisma is kind of a, a fluctuating scale in that regard. Same thing with attractiveness. In this system, you can get it as a quality or as a drawback. Contacts? I'm not sure if we're going to have that in this or not. It's going to be such a small-scale campaign I don't know how I'm going to be able to deliver on this, but my hope is that we're going to do this for Tuesdays, right? So three and a half hours roughly per session, about 15 to 16 hours of out-of-game play. What I would like to do is translate that into 15 to 16 hours of in-game play. So there's not a lot of, okay, we found a safe place, and then we're going to wait here as long as we can. Uh-oh. I'm hiding. I buried the alert box behind everything. Whoops. Let's just fix that up. Just in case I make that mistake again. And Jaybird, what's going on, man? Good to see you. Thanks for the follow. This might give an advantage to zombie knowledge. Oh, for sure. In that context, Don, I would also say your character would probably be one of those in the group who has seen the original Night of the Living Dead movie, which is probably the most crucial source of cinematic history that we're going to have at this point in reality for what a zombie is, what a zombie is not. So yeah, back to contacts. I'm not sure if that's something we're going to actually use considering how small of a scope I want to make the campaign. If we're going to play a 15-hour campaign, I don't want it to all of a sudden become we're in trouble, there's zombies everywhere, we have no gear, my guy knows a guy, and then we spend the entire campaign trying to get that resources or whatever from this contact. I'm not certain we want to go that way. Cowardly, cruel, delusions, emotional problems, drawback, 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 drawback. None of those really can be taken as a quality. Lazy, honorable is technically a drawback in this system. Hard to kill. Now that is a quality that a lot of people do like to take. Gives you bonus life points. Especially useful for survivors and the inspired, but I could see it being... Very handy for uh, the norms as well. Photographic memory. Alright, that is something I think is going to be very fitting for John's character. There's skills, weapons, possessions, character history, allies and contacts. <laughs> Man, they really want you to have contacts, huh? Here we go, qualities. All right, Jalen, see you in a bit. Okay, photographic memory. Let me just make sure I bookmark that so I'm not trying to find that again. Photographic memory. That's going to be a two-point quality for John's character. And just for specificity, those with photographic memories have an uncanny ability to remember things. After reading a book, they can quote passages without missing a word, and they almost never forget anything. The Zombie Master will, f will provide information that the character would remember when it is necessary. 
Also, characters with this quality receive a plus one bonus on any skill where memorizing facts is useful. Most scholastic skills fall under this category. Furthermore, any tasks where memory can play a role gain plus one to plus three bonus at the Zombie Master's discretion. So yeah, I think that's very fitting for John's character. It might be something that Don's, Don, you might want to take with your character as well. There's no rule against players taking the same quality or the same drawback. I do encourage some variety, considering we have five characters. We don't want them to all look like the same character. But the occasional crossover and spillover is okay. Nerves of Steel. Three-point quality, almost impossible to scare. Whether they're too dumb or too tough to be frightened is open to question. I don't know if we want to do that for John's character. It could be really cool to have a medic who is just unfazed by everything. I could also see it being very cool that the only guy who can save you is terrified by his own shadow. In that respect, I'll leave that part to John. I'm not going to spend all of his qualities. I don't think I'm going to spend all of his drawbacks either. I'm going to take a few that might fit and see what he thinks. Welcome back. Welcome back, Jalen. Thank you. Physical disability can be something as minor, if you want to call it that, as a missing or crippled arm or hand, or something as extreme as being a paraplegic. You might get a lot you're gonna get eight points if you make a paraplegic character but it's well worth it because you're taking a horrendous drawback in this kind of system i mean the zombie comes after you and how are you gonna get away pretty much dependent on a lot of people in that in that circumstance uh-oh what happened hey hey valtheris gifted a sub to ravencraft too cool man thank you so much are you with us A secret, a variable social drawback. Hmm. Show off, also a drawback. Resources. That is something that we may see some of our characters take. Could be taken as a bonus or as a negative. Supernatural qualities and drawbacks, we're just going to ignore all of those. I encourage any players to do so as well, even if you stumble across and you're like, Ooh, good luck, I can take that. No, you can't take that. So we'll just we'll just nip that in the bud right now. Alright, so in John's case, I'm not going to focus too much on qualities and drawbacks at this stage. We're going to move on to skills. Norms get 30 points. If I recall, 30, yeah, 30 skill points. Acrobatics, acting, beautician. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think John's going to take beautician. Brawling, bureaucracy, cheating, climbing, computer hacking. Kind of a, a very rare skill. I mean, especially in 1972, computer hacking. Possible to take. Computer programming, same deal. Crafting, dancing, demolitions. Driving. Well, John will get a kick out of it if his very first skill is drive. Because we have fun memories of that from previous campaigns where his character was not very good at driving. Okay, driving type, yep, we'll make it car. And one point for one point. Let's just double check, buying skills. Most skills are deemed regular, cost one point from levels one to five. After level five, each additional level costs three points. So for these characters, just for right now, I think I'm going to keep it under five just to keep the math a little simpler. And then any adjustments we want to make, we can certainly do so. Dodging. I think that will be a vital skill for John. And we will throw three points in that. I don't know about the attributes, though. I would guess dexterity for both of these, driving and for dodging. 
We'll find out more later on. I'm not seeing that exact rule offhand here. Bom, 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 bom. Escapism, engineering, electronics, first aid. He will definitely have some first aid and medicine. So yeah, those are going to be the skills that I think we want to throw max value in. And max in this case will be a five. First aid. Medicine. Bom, 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 bom. Hey, hey, pretty cool. Up to six viewers right now. Thanks, everybody, for being along today. First aid. Medicine. What are some of your favorite moments from zombie apocalypse stories that I might be able to borrow and put into our overarching narrative here. I do like to watch a lot of zombie movies, zombie TV shows. I've read the entire Walking Dead series from beginning to end. So I have a pretty decent background of horror that I can use, whether planned or improv, to kind of throw these characters on their heels. But it's always good to get some extra perspective. And while we got a few people here, if anything comes to your mind as far as I saw this movie once and this part was really cool, that might be something fun to add into this at some point. Okay. Humanities. Instruction. Instruction can be useful. Intimidation. Myth and legend. That is one that your character will probably end up taking there, uh, Lord Grelix. Myth and legend has a type, so it can be mythology, folklore, of uh, really any culture across planet Earth. Occult knowledge as well. It covers most of the basic metaphysical facts of whatever world serves as the background for the game, including a working knowledge of essence and other specific supernatural features. That may be a bit of a stretch. It might be cool and fitting for the character. I don't know if it's something you want to waste points on, considering we're not using those mechanics in the game. Mostly do cosmic horror. Well, my favorite horror movie of all time is Alien. So I definitely feel you on that. Maybe a, maybe sanity, a buff, or a debuff. Yep, yep. In that respect, too, I think the essence system, I'll need to look more into it, but I think that might be a handy tool to use for sanity slash insanity. I think they actually have a mechanic for that. Watching your friends eat your other friends. Oh, yeah. Ever since sin has cast a stone, yeah. Smooth talking. Singing. Hey, I was just doing that. Sleight of hand. Seduction. Everybody likes the seduction skill. I'm going to seduce the zombie, see if it'll stop trying to eat me. Oh, it might keep eating you. Just more ferociously. Because it looks like you like it. Questioning, kind of a interrogation skill. Stealth, storytelling. They made a song about that. <laughs> Voltaire. About watching your friends eat your other friends, or somebody trying to seduce the zombie? <laughs> Or both. Streetwise, surveillance, tracking, trance. Kind of a meditative skill. Yeah, you can withstand pain, hunger, and thirst far better. Trying to lay a zombie. <laughs> Goodness. Veterinary medicine, just like the medicine skill, but applies to animals. Traps, writing, I would definitely have that skill. Sometimes these kinds of games are fun to play too if you look at it from within your own perspective. 
and try to create yourself in this context. We did that with one of the campaigns that I did a few years ago. It was called Can You Survive the Zombie Apocalypse? And we all created our own characters, and then I kind of threw everybody for a shock right in the opening moments as I was the one who was the first zombie in the campaign, and I came attacking everybody else. I don't know that we really got much further than that. We found our safe house, we started gathering some supplies, and we never really came back to it. But it was cool. It's always cool to kind of envision what you might look like in this kind of setting. What you doing, Warren? Oh, there he goes. He came in and ran right out. All right, so here for John, I have spent 15 of his 30 skill points. Yeah, for sure. Throw that in the uh, for the love of shared music. Definitely give that a listen. Trucking on down the rocky stony road. Sciences. Yeah. Biology. I definitely think John is going to want to want some biology knowledge. And that's probably got... Uh, and the word is escaping me right now. It will apply a bonus to his other skills more than likely. Eleven points left for John. Play instrument questioning. I think that might be something he would use in a professional capacity. And that's going to be a perception skill. Occasionally has to question some deranged patients trying to find out what their conditions are, trying to read between what they're saying and what really happened. Would not recommend it in a G-rated area or a stream. <laughs> Well, we try to keep the uh, the swearing down in our streams, but we occasionally do let a little bit of it slip out there. Just human nature. But, uh, for show, man, for show. Hey, uh, Jaybird, on a separate topic, thanks for the follow. If, uh, if for no other reason than you knocked out the Haas 312. I think I got followed by that dude six times last night. <laughs> I actually ended last night's stream with a personal thank you to the six different 00312 hosses that followed me, and I asked them to please throw me some subs as well. <laughs> if you're all going to follow me, you must like my show so much, so let's see some subs, Hoss 312. Come on. Mechanic Notice. Went right over that one. Some degree of perception is always handy, but I don't like everybody to just be super keen and perceptive in these games because it really kind of throws off the horror nature of these. Okay, so in John's case, I would say he would need to be somewhat per perceptive though. It's kind of runs, it's kind of part of the deal of being a surgeon. If you don't know what you're looking at, you're not going to be particularly effective. Cool, so yeah, just post the rolls questioning 11 medicine first aid yep okay so john's looking good we got 2 5 10 15 19 24 28 so two more points do we take another skill or do we add two points onto his existing skills or do we save two points? Because, I mean, you never know in the course of the campaign itself when you're going to realize you need something and you don't want to wait until you get more skill points to pick it up. Crafting. Hmm. Yeah, I think for this case, I'm going to save... two points for John. I don't know if the system allows that. I'm assuming it does. Most of these kind of point by systems tend to be pretty lenient with your points. You don't have to spend them all at once. In Sean's case, uh, Radio Free Covenant, I know he has 
played some of these point buy systems before, and what he'll do is spend like 5% of his starting points, and he'll have like 40 points saved, and he'll build his character through the course of the campaign itself. A lot of fun to do it that way, but you might get killed on the very first attack roll. <laughs> okay, so John is looking good. Weapons, he's not going to start with any weapons or armor. Possessions. Yeah. These toggles right here at the top, they just turn off the blood and turn it into a grid. I wish it was literally a light mode and a dark mode. Unfortunately, blood or no blood. Character history. I bet John probably wants me to put something together in that respect for him as well. I will converse with him more later on today. See what we can come up with. All right. Back here to the the map that I built quite a while back. And I think, yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and pause right here, take a few minutes, get some hydration, and come back and see what the next stage of building this Agent Orange is. Thanks everybody for being here so far, and I will be right back.
Hey, hey, welcome back, Val. Welcome back, everybody. I'm gonna do another little segment here. And spoiler alert, if you're playing the campaign, probably in the best way possible, I'm going to create our default living dead. In Agent Orange, we do not call them zombies, much like in Walking Dead, they don't call them zombies. I like to have a different uh, nomenclature for them. And seeing as how Night of the Living Dead is the movie that inspired this whole campaign, it is also the movie that the characters are most likely to have seen, that they'll be able to be like, oh, it's one of those ghouls or what have you from that movie, Night of the Living Dead, and they'll probably start calling them Living Dead. That's what we kind of adopted in the first uh, three seasons, I think we did, for Agent Orange. Hey, baby. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Mmm. <laughs> Pizza. What? Oh, boy. <laughs> Thanks, darling. Oh, yeah. That's what's going on right now. A little French bread action. And a diet sodi. What a wife. All right, so here our living dead character points. We're not going to worry about any of that stuff. Is there a... No, doesn't look like it. So yeah, it looks like these zombies will just use the same basic character sheet as the players. Two strength, one dexterity, two constitution, a minus two intelligence, one to their perception, and a two on the willpower. Now this is our standard default ravaged living dead. Agent Orange, I've kind of, I kind of like to borrow from the best, I like to borrow the best parts of the different zombie sources that we have. While I do agree with uh, Max Brooks' statement that fast is cool but slow is scary, fast can be very scary as well, no doubt about it. And the way I've kind of translated that into the Agent Orange mythology is that if this is a fresh zombie that we're talking about, it's your buddy that just got bit and hasn't been torn to shreds by like 30 of these living dead, then when this guy gets back up as a living dead in their own right, he still is fresh as he was a few moments ago, if not even better, because the whole nature of what caused this virus in Agent Orange is the Agent Orange itself. The fact that it was used so prolifically in Vietnam, seemingly without thought of the consequences, I just kind of took it a few steps higher and was like, okay, well, once this toxin got in the at the atmosphere of Earth and then it was rained down onto the different continents, here's the result of what we're looking at. And occasionally this virus will enhance the dead in ways bigger and better than they ever were when they were alive. But if we're talking to zombie that Night of the Living Dead, it's been in the ground for six months and it's clawing its way out of its coffin and then digging its way up out of the soil, this is the zombie we're looking at. It's slow, it's stupid. You're probably going to be able to get away from it and take it out, but if there's like 50 of them around you, you're probably screwed. So just, just a heads up if you are one of the players in this campaign. I'm showing you our basic default zombie. But as you well know, there will be other zombies as well. So life points, or in the zombie's case, death points. 26, so it can actually take more damage than John's character. That's not comforting. But the speed is a 2. So... It, yeah, they're very slow, and they're not likely to be catching up to you on great occasion. Sure. 
So, rice aroni and drinking Kool Aid. Very nice. Dig some rice aroni. You better be listening, Don. This is vital information. Okay, essence pool, I'm sure. Okay, so the zombies do have an essence pool. So I'm thinking I probably will track that for every character, even though we're not using the metaphysical rules of all flesh must be eaten. It does still work in the context that Valtheris was talking about, as far as sanity, insanity. Okay. Now for the zombie here, qualities. Doesn't look like they have any of those. They just have, well, I'm sure it's the monster equivalent of qualities. Skills, nothing there. Okay, weapons. We have the dreaded bite. Only takes one. And it ain't gonna be pretty. And see, I can't read rate of fire number of attacks I think all right what am I looking at here for zero damage fight one no d4 there we go okay d4 times two that's the multiplier let's try that all right so the bite is dealing damage but it's not any attack. Okay, brawling skill is two, so I'm sure that's going to be still rolling a zero to hit. Oh, nope, that's number of attacks. Yeah, I cannot read this character sheet. Rolling a ten to hit for two damage. There we go. Okay, so simple as that. These, these are very simple character sheets, and it's, I want to say, twice as simple as your typical D&D &D game because you're rolling D10s instead of D20s, so the variations you need to keep track of are half the usual. And this combat system has a hit location diagram. So assuming that you just say, I attack the living dead, after you roll this attack, the system then calls for a D10 roll on a result of one, you've hit him in the head. And assuming that you have done sufficient damage, let's see. If the cumulative damage exceeds, uh, da, 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 da. yeah, generally 20 points inflicted in a single blow or bullet will decapitate or kill the zombie. Now that's not a great amount of damage that we're likely to see here in the early stages, but as these characters come across some firearms and hopefully some kind of bladed weapons hopefully they can start one hitter quittering these things on a regular basis otherwise if you roll something two or higher on that die 10 you're looking at hitting them right arm left arm torso right leg left leg called shots are of course a thing in the system and they are well it's on a different page entirely that was where i initially had my bookmark when I dug this book out for the first time in a few years. Dumb as dead wood. That is one of the factors here that you can use for, uh, or that is applicable to the zombie that we're talking about here. Basic zombie intelligence. It detects something alive and tries to kill it. End of story. It cannot open doors or climb over things very well. It can't do much more than walk in straight lines and knock things down. Has intelligence of minus two regardless of how bright it was in life. And cannot use language or tools. So in a way, these are even lesser zombies than we see in Night of the Living Dead. Because those zombies are using tools to try and break stuff down. And when cars' headlights are left on, like they're bashing out the lights. Partly because I imagine it hurts them, but perhaps more sinister is it throws the whole area into darkness, which, of course, we as humans, we need the light to be able to see. This system gives a lot of different powers and creative tools you can use to make these zombies very unique. Some of them, for movement features, you can add things like aquatic, climbing, leaping, burrowing, 
Some of them are the quick dead and can actually move faster than your typical humans. Even a sprinter is likely to have a chance of being caught by one of these quick zombies. And similar, the zombie strength. You can have them be weaklings, you can have them be equivalent to humans. Some of them can be, like if you've played State of Decay, the Juggernaut zombies that you get up and you smack them six times with your sword and then they just <laughs> you're just ah! so yeah there's a a range of things with the zombie senses are their senses like the dead are their senses like the living some of them can have senses like a hawk or x-ray vision some zombies have a life sense so they could they just detect where life is regardless of the distance and there's there's some basis of uh precedent behind that if you look in some of the the zombie tales that we have out there how do they always know where to go especially when there's a giant horde of them is it really just coincidence that they happen to wander into the areas where people still are? Are they really just always wandering so it's only a matter of time before they hit anywhere? Or is there some kind of sense that they're following to find where the, the living still are? Alright, so there's our zombie setup. I don't think special zombie features, acid blood, noxious odor, explosive personality... So, again, that's kind of... This system is pretty old, so I don't want to say it borrowed from State of Decay. I don't know the State of Decay borrowed from it. Great minds think alike all the time. But that's another feature in the State of Decay, is some of the zombies, when you kill them, they blow up. So you definitely want to kill them with a ranged weapon so you don't get your ass killed at the same time. Spreading the love. That is one of the features of this zombie, which... Assuming I don't find it here relatively quickly. It's got to be on one of these pages. I got to imagine it's... Yeah, it's not here anywhere. Must be in a different page. But spreading the love, I got to imagine, is just the you get bit, you turn. They just probably have a much more eloquent way of putting it in this system. And further in the book, we have zombie dogs, zombie rats, zombie cows. A lot of cool additions here. Other survivors. And then they, they finish off the book with different settings. So if you want to play like cosmic zombies, if you want to play old west zombies, things of that nature. It's, uh, it's in the realm of possibility. Conduit, what's up man? Good to see you. Alright, there we go. So I'm not chomping in everybody's ear. So yeah, what you may have caught or may have just missed their conduit was the creation of our basic generic living dead. Slow, dumb, somewhat resilient, somewhat tough, perhaps even a lesser zombie than we see in Night of the Living Dead because these zombies can't even use tools. So we did that, created John's character. We also put together the baseball stadium map, which is not really appropriate. It's not what I remember. It's more fitting for the apocalypse already. I was looking for using the baseball stadium as our starting location. The concert is playing, we're all in the stadium. How are we gonna get out when all of a sudden the stadium is overrun by zombies? Uh, I might still use this setup here. We'll probably just have to imagine a different layout for it. 
And that is the end of the playlist of which my dad played guitar on every single one of those songs we've been listening to over the last hour and a half. So the rest of these tracks for the next hour or so. This is the Agent Orange playlist that I have built through Epidemic Sound. Let's see. I do not like that bloop sound through Roll20, so I'm glad that happened here. Can just disable that. Just close that out. Yeah, I think the volume's probably a bit too high. There we go. Excellent. <laughs> yes, indeed. Good old sod. All right. And I think I'm going to need some other kind of background here for the streaming setup. Because even once we get all of the camera frames in there, it's still just a generic black background. And I always like to have something... Uh, a little bit adds a little bit more depth. It might even be similar to the Baldur's Gate setup where it just kind of looks like a tabletop. Because I do have a, a large image library of royalty free images just for that purpose. Hey, Don, is that your character on the bottom there? The Paul Gorman? Gotcha. Is it named after Gorman from Aliens? Correct. Yeah, the silo tech on top is Jason. Yeah, Jason will have a nice uh, little feel good when he comes when he comes to. He's not feeling so great today, so that's why he's not with us on this part of the stream. Hopefully, he can join in before this all wraps up. But yeah, Valtheris gifted a tier one sub to Ravencraft, so very cool. And then also, Lord Grelix did a tier one sub during the opening of today's activities. So I believe we're we're doing pretty good on subscriptions here for only being affiliate for a few days. Alright. I mean, it ain't sod. Nothing is, but I think this, this playlist going here through Agent Torns. They've got some good 70s themed music here that will work for us. Alas, Sod only had the two albums, and then I have the three Six the Hard Way songs as well, which was my dad's band from man, 60, 62 to 67, I want to say. They only had uh, the three songs released, which were the first, the three I played at the very start of the stream. Is there a non-destroyed stadium map? Not in my image library. I just had, well, maybe. Well, yeah, good call there. I sure do. <laughs> I did a brief scroll here at the start when I was looking into building the maps and you can just kind of get a glimpse of just how enormous the image library is through Roll20 here.
Lots and lots of cool stuff. But yeah, the Apocalypse Metropolis sets, I think, are our best bet. So what I want here... That, that... Let's just kill... Kill this map. Piece at a time. And we'll bring in the clean map, since Justin had the brilliant idea of... Hey, why don't you look somewhere else other than where you were looking and maybe you'll find it. I'm not always the brightest bulb sometimes. Sometimes I just kind of stare at it forever until I'm like, What if... Oh, yeah. I definitely experienced that playing Alien Isolation a lot over the last few days. <laughs> I'm just like... I don't want to say I'm baffled because I'm, I'm somewhat self-aware of what my pluses and minuses are. But in this respect, I was a bit more baffled than I expected to be at just how poor my perception is sometimes. <laughs> like, I can't find a save point. I'm playing for like an hour. The alien kills me eight times, and I'm finally like, oh, there was a save point in this area that I walked past like eight times. Could have made a world of difference. If you want to watch me get killed by the alien in all sorts of horrible, horrible ways. Check out the late night stream from last night. <laughs> Was not pleasant. He's a freaking genius. Yeah, look at that. A perfectly clean stadium map. Some, well, no, this is kind of fitting too, because even though well, I think the uh, the river, the Pecos River, does run along Carlsbad, I believe. But that's also part of our intro setup: is that it's like going to be the worst rainstorm in a decade, and lightning, thunder, flooding everywhere, and getting out. I don't want to do too much spoilers, but getting out of the intro area is going to be a little trickier than our initial cast had it. Our initial cast were the superheroes. They didn't start off that way, but they survived the apocalypse long enough that they became very good at what they did. And in that respect, they were superheroes in a zombie apocalypse. These characters are going to be very normal. There's not going to be a lot of progression for the characters because we're only going to play four games. They'll get some skill points. They'll probably add them onto their existing skills or maybe learn how to use a gun on the fly as their as necessity dictates but this initial area given the flooding and the rainstorms and the fact that there's a concert going on the streets are just packed with cars that are parked double part triple part the parking lots were not big enough to sustain the crowd that came into this area so, as I was saying, it's going to be a little more difficult for the characters to actually get out of the starting area than our first group of characters had it. And it'll be interesting to see how that happens. Oh, really? I guess I always looked at it as water. I guess it could be... It could be either. Because, I mean, this stuff here is definitely... Some kind of shrubbery, but I guess I looked. I was looking at this like maybe as like some kind of seaweed or just like wet, muddy terrain. And then of course, giant baseball statue here in the front. And our other maps. Stadium interior, I may still use that. The Dassault outpost, I will probably repurpose in some capacity for this campaign. We never explored this on a map level in the first campaign when we played it. So it definitely has purpose. And as for the Fallen City here, this is where just everything all these random pieces came from that you saw on the previous map. Parking garage, outlet stores. I'm gonna use the transmog 
see if there's anything else I can grab from our previous Agent Orange campaigns. Welcome back, Val. Thanks for hanging out. Hmm. Okay, so this map, I think we did explore. This is Kingman. And I think we came back here a few times. Because this was, yeah, on the way to New Ford. And there was the, uh, the Monsanto facility out along that highway. And I think the reason the lighting is the way it is. Yeah, these are... Oops. Okay, so something's not working out. But these are... Yeah. So the light source changes as the vehicles move across the map. That's how we explored these maps. We would just visit these a building at a time and check out what was within. And I think we did the circle around the entire Kingman area. And this was actually the final area that we went to up here atop the hill. And it was the area that we needed to go to. So I think there might be some use for this map. Maybe repurpose it entirely. It's all the same elements from those map packs that I, I already have. These are just among the most difficult maps for me to make because a lot of the other ones are kind of created in larger grids. Like here's a 25 by 25 grid, slap it down, grab a few more pieces and add some decoration. This here, these maps were very much, here's the green grass. Here's a piece of road, here's a piece of road, here's another piece of road, and then here's the buildings in between. Like this was, each element of this is a separate layer. I don't know how much I want to, how much time I want to put into building those kinds of maps for a four game campaign. Here's one we did not use. This was intended for our first entry into Las Vegas in that previous campaign and this is all I put down of it and I think this was one of the simpler maps this is actually a pre-built one layer 25 by 25 Yeah, and this one is pretty basic compared to the Kingman map, but this was the map that we spent the majority of time on. This is Laughlin and Bullhead City. This here is the, man, what was it? The, uh, not the Aquarius, I forget, the Riverside. The, uh, the Riverside Hotel and Casino. A lot of this just built off of my memory of having been to Laughlin a few times in my life and Bullhead City across the river there and this was kind of our our home base for agent orange 77 we did a lot of cannibalizing of these structures inside and out there were used to actually be more structures on this map but as we tore them down for the raw resources i actually took those buildings away here we have Hospital, this, did I not label it? 
I guess I did not, but this was the police station, if I recall correctly. This is a map that has probably served its use throughout Agent Orange history, just kind of brought up as a fun bit of nostalgia here. I don't think we will actually reuse this in any capacity in this campaign. Although... Wasn't this... Yeah, that was John's character, wasn't it? <laughs> I think it was. Everybody else was up here. Random pictures of 70s males and females. Some of them not 70s. That was uh, Dylan's character. He was using Daryl from The Walking Dead. And then Justin said, we we're sure to survive because we got Sean Connery. <laughs> and that, that was Justin's guy, I thought, right? That was Logan. And there was Sean playing the uh, the feral kid. Yep. So yeah, fun bit of nostalgia there. Here was our home base on a much closer perspective. You can see here the state of decay influence on Agent Orange. Sadly, I love that game a lot more than most of my friends, and that was at least 50% of the reason why the campaign started to drag down. In the way it did, most of the players like something a bit more action-packed. They're more than capable of role-playing for hours on end and delivering top-notch uh, role-play. But the other half of the game that was very much here's our list of supplies and here's what we're short on so we need to go venture out and try to find these materials was not always uh well received by a lot of the group everybody had their names on their room i really like this kind of detail seeing these maps and being able to look back at it and just so much detail put into these okay well we have vacant rooms so we can take in two more survivors And, oh, yep, here's Sean, Charlie's groovy room, no adults allowed. <laughs> and then here was Brett's area. He was playing the chemist who was making fuel, and he had some crops growing out here. A large part of our game was we find these resources so that we can build this fence around our casino. And oh! What's going on, my friend? How are you today? And then, of course, here the casino floor, where I believe we managed to even get the power running again so that some of these slots were operational just to provide some kind of downtime for the characters. Oh, and then, of course, uh, the professional there as young Charlie's friend in arms there we had two kids in the group and both of them were pretty pretty capable of surviving on their own without all of these adults oh and then we had dogs as well we had a pit bull and all of her puppies all of which survived i don't know that they necessarily would have had the campaign run through to conclusion but at least at the point we ended all the dogs were still alive so as I said at the end of the Dawn of the Dead 2004, it's a happy ending because the dog survived. <laughs> this map as well, I don't see any use for, for our Across the Pecos. I could see entering Las Vegas. We did have superpowers. Yeah, that was one thing that started to develop at the very end of the campaign, which I kind of put in there almost as a... Uh, jumping the shark moment but also as a way to entice the players hopefully to retain interest in the campaign and sadly it's not that everybody lost interest a lot of it was real life first some players schedules just changed and we weren't able to continue the campaign with the level of quality that i like to put together oh i'm doing all right hendo just building up some zombie apocalypse maps here 
and nine days to spare. I definitely may. I definitely uh, shortchanged myself on time. I've had a lot of the story built in my head over the last month, but there is a lot of mechanical details here that are required. Yeah, this is another map that's not likely to see use again. Just another fun bit of nostalgia. This was the hospital map. Characters went in here to raid. I used these indications kind of like signs on the wall so the characters didn't always have to ask me, so what does it look like this area le leads to? And just very direct. Here's, here's the waiting room, the cafeteria. Here is a bathroom, pile of bones. This was, of course, the the money stash here in the far back area. These maps were also very, very tricky to build because Zombie Apocalypse is not a very common played role play. The maps that you can find for it on Roll20 or anywhere, really, from the sources I've checked, kind of require some finagling to put everything together. This isn't my finest work. It worked for what we needed, but when we're playing Star Wars or D&D, the map quality is a lot better because there's so many people making maps, and I can just easily buy something of good quality and snap that down for our roleplay. This was definitely one of the trickier maps to play as a player. You can see everybody's tokens are kind of lined up awkwardly. Justin is upside down here. And that's because I turned their vision from 360 to like, man, I want to say like a 110 degree angle. So they had some peripheral and a tiny bit behind them, but otherwise they couldn't see behind them. So it was encouraging them to constantly be turning their tokens to be on the lookout. Because sometimes I would just populate the map with a zombie and start sneaking up behind them. Be like, is anybody going to turn around and see me? Is anybody going to turn around and see me? Oh, nope. All right, here we go. <sighs> Well, yeah, I think that's, that is it for the existing maps. So anything else that's going to be constructed for a map is going to have to be done here over the next several days. I don't know how many maps I'm actually going to construct for this campaign. This might be something we do very theater of the mind. That's how we did a lot of a lot of Agent Orange, really, until we moved on to Roll20, and I just became so used to having easy access to maps and that much more of a descriptive storytelling narrative. I don't know how much we're gonna how much I'm really gonna spend crafting maps for this campaign, considering how short of a time we're gonna be playing it. What I do know is that we have Eric Wolf here. Jason's character. We went over his background earlier. Vietnam vet works at a missile silo and is enjoying the concert. James, uh, it escapes me right now. Justin or Don, do you guys remember what his character concept was? I know John is going to be playing the medic kind of character and that was something we did earlier. We went over constructing his character more or less to completion. I haven't gone fully through his qualities or his drawbacks, but his attributes, his points, his skills are mostly set. A couple saved points. And I haven't added any combat skills for him because, I mean, he's the medic. And then Justin, I know that you're playing... Like, man, what was it that you said? Like, a good old boy just likes to race bikes and be out in the dirt. And he likes to hunt. He likes to fish. And he just being out in nature is kind of his gig. And now that I think of it for James, I do recall something about, like, a big, uh, like, a 10-passenger ten passenger, ten passenger van. But I don't remember the character concept. I remember what he had more than who he's supposed to be. And then Don is playing, well, now he's uh, he's given me a different concept because his initial concept was uh, a lighting technician at the concert. And that's not to say the character he's, he's pitching to me here is 
incapable of being a lighting tech. It just seems like Don has kind of pivoted his character concept. Is am I am I incorrect? Gotcha. So then in in your case, Don, your reason for being at the concert then is shifted from I'm an employee of the venue to I'm now here in some kind of enjoyable capacity. Now, what kind of uh, skill set are you thinking of taking? And if you're available, Don and Justin, uh, it's it's totally easier if it works for you. If you guys just want to jump in the role-playing Unlimited Assemble voice chat, and I can start building your video frames here live on the stream, and you guys can talk in person if you don't want to type everything. Psychic bookstore owner, loves Ren Fair. Some skill with a sword, okay. What kind of sword are you thinking? There we go. Go ahead and uh, say something again. You were coming in a little low, but I think I got you. I'm here. Very cool. Very cool, yeah. Sounds like you're coming in loud and clear here through the stream. I imagine if anybody can't hear you, they'll say so. But yeah. How has uh, your character creation come along? Looks like you've got your points set up for attributes. Yeah, I've just started uh, building them. I'm looking at the, uh, I got the PDF of the all flesh. So I'm looking up how to do that. Very cool. Yeah, it looks like you've got the the basic section down, and then qualities and drawbacks will probably be what you'll spend the longest time on. Skills, maybe 15, 20 minutes. Tops. The only thing that I wasn't sure about was contacts. I believe that is a quality, and just in the theme of trying to keep a 16-hour in-game narrative, the same as our 16-hour out-of-game uh, allotment of time that we have to play. I don't know how well the contact nature is actually going to fit in. So that might be one of the only things that I disallow. Right, that, that makes sense. Otherwise, uh, the metaphysical qualities and stuff like that just skip over entirely because none of us have none of the characters will have that but otherwise i could see feasibly anything else that i was looking at in there both as a, a positive or as a drawback i could see any of that being useful
Have you got any thoughts, Justin, as far as backstory for your character would be concerned? I mean, how, how in-depth do you want it to get? Because, I mean, I'm not going to do a lot of playing with these guys. Oh, for sure. I would say what Jason put down is at, like, the extreme detailed end of what we need. I don't know that we need a lot, but some elements that could create some kind of dialogue throughout the course of the story during any moments where your life is not imminently being threatened. I don't imagine... if I mean, we got five characters. If we have five elements that we can talk about, then I think we're doing great. Yeah, sure. They'll, I'll have enough stuff to fill up some stuff. Perfect. And I think Don is playing something that's actually kind of true to his real nature, so I imagine this would be one where he could actually have a lot to contribute in that respect. So yeah, it looks like your character's coming together pretty well, just the skills, qualities, what have you. That's not even something necessarily needs to be done today. Character tokens, definitely something I'm going to need to grab out, but that'll be dependent on what you guys create. We can see here, got a pretty decent selection. Some of these are a little comical, but some of them kind of fitting. I always liked this one. I don't know if anybody would ever want this guy. <laughs> oh, we can't even see him on the stream. I'll have to drag him out. <laughs> Naked man with a gun. These guys have coral. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hey, I'm in the zombie apocalypse. How's it going? <laughs> this guy I always like to use uh, in mask because I think they have the same token, but some of them wearing green flannel shirts, some of them wearing purple flannel shirts, and you can kind of use them as like a band of, yeah, exactly, band of ruffians. Yeesh. You do not want that zombie coming after you. Yowie wowie. Yeah, this was the first zombie pack that I purchased, I believe, for tokens. Football player zombie. Pretty cool. Definitely had to send that uh, clown zombie after James. <laughs> Yeah, I remember that's how we took out uh, Mike's character in the very first Agent Orange campaign, because he got himself locked on the wrong side of the door from uh, from Don. Speaking of which, what's up, Don? Hey, what's up? Alright, so looks like Don is going to be down here. Just fix that up real quick. Dun dun. Drag it down. Hold control to set up precisely. Oh, and now it's Justin. You guys are tricking me. So Justin will get moved down to the J-Man spot over here. And then, oh, good enough. So next, I want to add a new window capture using the same Discord source. And this one will be Don's. Get Gail that. says hi. What's up, Gail? How's it going? Sorry about the G-Men today. There we go. Get that. Get Don a little more centered. Alt key all the way. This was one I had trouble with when I was initially building. I couldn't figure out how to crop these things, so alt key. 
dun 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 dun. And then. There we go. How's that? Good, good. How you doing, man? Doing good. I had a my computer went through a, an update that like decided to shuffle everything, and it was weird. <laughs> Gail says hi. Hey, hey, Gail. What's up? Uh, sorry about the G-Man today. It's all good. We know they, they suck this season, so we're just used to it by now. <laughs> all right. Don's looking pretty hey, good we're there. We're three brothers now. I couldn't even say That's right. how either of my teams are doing anymore. There. All right. Get mine. Good thing there. we have a local team now that we can root for. <laughs> <laughs> if you say so. All right. Just keep trimming. Yeah, I think you guys have your cameras a lot closer to you than I do, because I I always seem a little smaller in my screen, especially when I shrink it down like that. <laughs> Look at me, I'm so tiny. Almost there. This would be the moment when Jason jumps into the Discord chat and then... I start this process entirely over because now all of our frames are cut off. All right, looks good enough to me. There we go, there we go. Let's shuffle the alert box back to the top of the sources. Make sure you always have that if you're a streamer so that your alerts are not buried underneath your Mr. Orange visage like mine was earlier when Jaybird did the follow. All right. So, Don, how up-to-date are you on character creation rules? Um, not as much. Um, I was listening to some of the stuff you were going through, and I didn't have a character sheet in front of me to follow along with. Um, the backstory that I'm thinking of for my particular character at this point, because, again, as I mentioned in the chat, having two engineer mechanical type people kind of overkill. So I was thinking that uh, my character went to Berkeley and um, he was went he was a scientist he went in for the sciences however um, he got drawn into the occult and wrote a couple of books based upon the science of the occult um, used the money that he earned from writing the books to buy himself a psychic bookstore and delved into renaissance fairs he learned how to hack and slash with a sword he's not like you know a samurai or a ninja or anything he could just basically hold his own when it comes to hacking and slashing almost like uh sca type fighting i like it should add some nice depth to uh the starting crew because we definitely want if there's five of us, I feel like at least two of you should have combat capabilities. I don't know that all five characters necessarily need to. At least not on a weapon proficiency type of level. Everybody should have some, some kind of way of brawling to defend themselves. Yeah, and whatever the capacity. The reason why I'm there is I could be the spiritual advisor to one of the members of the band. Yeah. I think my guy will probably have gun ability because he's a red thing who was out shooting. Yeah, my guy would, would probably be, you know, like uh, he does tarot readings for one of the guys before the show to make sure that the show goes well and everything like that. So one of the band members might be pretty superstitious. <laughs>
you know, so my character would definitely be an intelligence based character with a little bit of physical to be using the sword. Yeah, definitely. Probably intelligence and perception based, just like we built John's character earlier, just with different skills and qualities. Because you'll definitely be perceptive, I think, with the, the back set, the background that you're laying out here. And I can see Jason and James' characters also having some level of firearms proficiency. It's just a matter of who brought their gun to the concert, I guess. Always look to the redneck. <laughs> I'm sure he probably has like a rifle or a shotgun on a gun rack in his truck or something. Yeah, I could see that being the case for sure. Yeah, I like that we're building this at the time. I can see Justin's Discord there. We're getting a little off center there, so I can easily fix that. Da, 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 da. Yes. Perfect. Justin just looks like a floating head. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a little bit. <laughs> Straight from the Futurama galaxy, it's J Man! <laughs> oh, yeah, we can come and play. <laughs> and then we put his jar back. <laughs> Yeah, Justin does say haru a lot. <laughs> well, all right. So we've got some uh, some good character concepts set up there. We have access to the PDF for character creation there, Don. And it's a very simple process. I mean, half of the book is unnecessary because a lot of it is just the different types of zombies and the different types of settings you can play in and the first part of the book I think is just kind of a, a mini short story on a, like a zombie short story all right I'm gonna take a look at that really quick very cool you do get the 14 points for your primary attributes that's the easiest thing to set up, your attributes and your secondary attributes. And it's point for point. Human maximum is five, technically six, but I don't see anybody having a six. Not only because it would be unrealistic for the group, but probably too expensive. Total of 14? Yeah, 14 points. Yeah, and while we got you all here for a few minutes before we start winding down the world building stream here, of course, don't forget that we are live every Tuesday with our actual role playing experience. This week will be the fourth chapter of Star Wars What If, and our last time playing Star Wars What If until November, because that's what we're doing right here is we're building Agent Orange for our October Tuesdays gameplay. And then once we get back to November, we're going to actually come back to the Baldur's Gate, Dungeons and Dragons, and Star Wars What If. We're going to be alternating every other Tuesday, kind of a mixed bag of roleplay for uh, whatever you guys are interested in watching. And this coming Wednesday for Out of Character, we're actually going to have Sean from Radio Free Covenant. He's going to be talking about his homebrew role-playing system that he's been working on for a good number of years now. And it's it looks like it's really coming along and starting to gain some traction. So we're going to be asking him some questions about what makes his system unique and what makes it fun. And yeah, I hope to catch you all there for both of those events or all of those events, really. And uh, can you put, um, 
The book is in our um, uh, Google Drive. I don't think it's in the Google Drive. I think there's a link to it directly from the Discord chat for Agent Orange. If I can find the rules. There we go. So yeah, I can we can expedite some of the math stuff here at least while you're looking around, Don. So for your life points, you're going to add your con and your strength together. That's three. And then multiply that by four, and then add ten. Okay, twenty-two. Exactly the same as John's. He just has a, a reverse. He has a one strength and a two dex. Okay. Yeah, I hand coronation not so good, but I'm a little buffer than, you know. Okay, so I'm just average buff. Yeah. Average, average scrawn. For endurance, you're going to add your con, strength, and your willpower. Which that's a what, a four? Five. Nope, four. You're right. And then multiply by three and add five. 17. All right, endurance points. And then your speed is con plus dexterity times two. That's four. I'm not really a sprinter. All right, you run four miles an hour or about two yards a second. And then your essence pool is the addition of all of your primary attributes together. So it should be 14 for everybody. Yep, 14. And then, yeah, the only thing you should need to look at in the book is after this section of character creation. So you can find out which qualities, which drawbacks you want to take. And then beyond that the skills list and how many ranks you want to put in any skill. Okay, yeah, that's because my stats right now are looking at two strength, one dex, one con, five intelligence, four perception, one willpower. Yes, indeed. That's what I see. And let's go ahead and pan back over to Justin's character, see if we have... Yeah, we do. We got some progress. Why don't you tell us about it? Well, I figured he's a uh, kind of a dumb hick guy who likes to just like race and shoot and stuff. So he's got fast reaction time because he's good. He's good behind the wheel, um, and he's reckless and a show-off when he's behind the wheel too so he's just like develops nerves of steel because he likes to just do some stupid shit like hey oh, what's this shit ah kind of like you know uh, <laughs> steve-o or something oh geez <laughs> so if this character does in fact bite it during the campaign his dying words will be hey y'all watch this Basically. <laughs> Show off, reckless, nerves of steel, skills. Oh, looks like that's coming along too. Just haven't assigned the exact points, but brawling, driving, little first aid, and some gun skills. Very cool. Yeah, I'm just picking what I think he should have, and then I'm going to assign the, the values in a minute. Yeah, and just to kind of summarize the, the context of the campaign as it is so far, this isn't really a spoiler. This is kind of what I've told 
the players coming into this and you as our preliminary audience here, just a, a bit of a, a trailer, I guess, is it's uh, <laughs> it's not dissimilar from a lot of the zombie apocalypse stories you see out there. What we're trying to make here is something that's very fast paced, action oriented, but with a lot of role play and focus on the anxiety and the fear that these characters are feeling, assuming that they do feel fear. I don't know if any characters are going to take the, uh, well, it might be the nerves of steel or something similar along that regard. I don't know how many people are going to actually have that. I hope not everybody does. We don't want to portray a group of norms as all being badass. We haven't delved too far into John's attributes in that respect either. So I don't know what, what he's thinking about playing. But we're looking at a, a fairly normal group of strangers that are going to be thrown together by some radical events that originate from within this baseball stadium rock and roll concert during Christmas week of 1972. And these characters, after being forced together, are going to be in the fight of their lives on several occasions as they just desperately try to find a place where they can get some breathing room. And that's pretty much going to be the context of the entire four-week experience as I see it. We're going to have a lot of action beats and lulls during that time. But the entire scope of the campaign from beginning to end is intended to be the flight to safety. And there's a little bit of an indication there in the, the title across the Pecos. Maybe across the river we'll find some kind of sanctuary. Based off of what we know of the weather coming into this it may not be as easy of a trip as anticipated we're talking about the worst thunderstorm in a decade lightning flooding massive overcrowding in a tiny town that only has a population of about 1700 at this point in time so it's their their ecosystem is very ill prepared for this mass influx of people that are here just to enjoy some rock and roll much less prepared. Right, I'm thinking two point delusion that he is actually psychic. <laughs> Very cool. Much less are they prepared for a zombie apocalypse on top of these thousands and thousands of people here. So, yeah, that's what we have in store for you beginning Tuesdays in October. Additionally, our out-of-character show over the next few weeks, we're going to have uh, some focuses. Uh, still our usual qu interactive Q&A. It's not going to be maybe so precise as these three questions. It's going to be more of a general topic. So he will make uh, omens and, and uh, tarot cards and things like that as a source of gaining knowledge of the future when he makes a lot of his decisions. I see. And what skill is this? No, it's a drawback delusion. Gotcha. Really the drawback. <laughs> All right, then. Yeah, so he has no real power. Anytime I make a decision, it's right. because of the fact that I contacted the psychic realm, and this is the direction it told me to go into. I can dig it. Whenever I'm right, it helps me out. Whenever I'm wrong, well... <laughs> <laughs> there was a flaw in the universe. Oh, goodness. Yeah, I like how you're setting yourself up for failure from the get-go, because you're, you're reading that things are going to go well for this band, and then all of a sudden the worst possible event could happen. <laughs> They're all going to be looking at you like, you read the cards wrong, bro. And it'd be like, no, the universe shifted upon <laughs> its access. <laughs> oh, goodness. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen, for being here for this Agent Orange world-building session. We got a bit further in than we were earlier today. A lot further as far as character concepts and creation are concerned. And yeah, we will catch you this coming Tuesday for Star Wars What If, Wednesday for Out of Character. Again, we're going to have Sean from Radio Free Covenant on, and we'll be asking him questions about his, his homebrew system. Thank you, guys, and thank you, viewers. Thank you, Valtheris, for that gift sub. Thank you, Lord Grelix, for the Prime sub. Are you with us?